McDonald's coffee. The Broncos are gonna lose today. Never, it's nothing special. Small. 49ers are biased on KD. That is a stupid idea. You're com no. If I can't take it, one my team, I'll give the Colts the benefit of the doubt. Madden 21 was so bad. I'm gonna so like playing my body again. Has he played? Has he started in the Try to tell ya. Tag him on Instagram. Second, and all these tantrums. I could have. Monte Foreman coming out of Texas. Truly appreciate y'all. How are we doing, folks, today? That one dude, 2020, with the MI6 Sports Network. For people that don't know who he is, of course, he used to do the NFL, the NFL doing the rules, analysts for the NFL for a while there. In my opinion, like I've said before to people, the best in the college football business, the head of officiating for the XFL in 2020, and doing what he's doing. And also, I believe, started his own company. But, Dean, how are we doing today? I'm good. How are you? Doing good, man. Love some uh, talking some college football, and like I said, just really get to know like what you're about. If people don't know your story, feel free to share. Sure. So, but Dean, I gotta ask you though. Um, people that may not know who you are, what your story is, they see you on college football game day. But who is Dean like off the field, or what is your story to where how you got to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, I just I grew up. I love I love sports. I played sports my whole life. I just wanted to be involved in it. Um, like a lot of kids, I wanted to play sports professionally. I, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't good enough to do that. And, and so when I, I went to school, I graduated university and, uh, you know, I just sent my resume to the NFL and major league baseball and NBA. I grew up in New York and all of the, the pro sports organizations have offices in New York city and the NFL called and, and they had a couple of internships available. And, uh, I interviewed for a couple and, they offered me the internship in officiating. And I didn't know anything about it. I, I didn't. I wasn't exposed to officiating. I wasn't interested in it. But uh, but I said, hey, this is the NFL. I want to get my foot in the door. And um, I grew to love it. I spent a long time assisting and putting videos together, learning the game from watching um, watching it on video and, and being surrounded by some really good people. And, uh, you know, I got involved in instant replay when the NFL brought it back in 1999 and, and, and my career just kind of took off from there. I was, I was in charge of the officiating department for four years. And then in 2017, I, I made the move to TV and, and joined Fox sports. And now I, uh, I'm on the uh, college and NFL broadcast doing rules analysis. Of course you do. Uh, of course, a great job. And then I said, like, huge fan of me being called football and football, but I got to ask you though, you know, everybody has their own, like the beginning and what people gave you advice, but if somebody's watching this or loves college football, loves the NFL, what would be that piece of advice you would give them for somebody that's interested in the sports media world? Yeah. You know, I've, I've learned a lot about the sports media world and, and I think it's, you know, I think patience. I always tell people, you know, today, especially younger people that are, that are trying to break in, You've got to be patient. Um, I know everybody kind of wants to reach their goals and um, it'll happen. I think networking, meeting people, putting yourself out there is so important. And and trying things like for me, like I didn't know anything about officiating. It turned into a career. So maybe on on paper, it doesn't feel like something you'd be interested in. But take a chance if there's an opportunity in an area that you hadn't considered um, take a chance and you never know. You never know who you could meet. You never know what other avenue that could that could take you on. And uh, and so, again, be patient, but but kind of put yourself out there and, and diversify as much as possible with your experience, because the more people you meet and, and the more skills that, that you have, that's going to make you more attractive, you know, when when for, a, you know, a potential employer and in the in the entire you know media world. That's where, Dean, I think a lot of people misfocus just exactly like you're saying, be patient just because you put out one episode or reach out to yeah. one person. Expect to know, folks. And like I say this not to like, oh, my gosh, you're talking about yourself. It, don't forget the beginnings. Recording in the heart card, meeting guys like you who's doing a great job and never forgetting the beginning. I think that's where, Dean, people 
probably get it um, the wrong motive. But Christian, you know, I think a lot of people might not know, you started your own company called Under the Hood. Uh, tell yeah, us kind of yeah. what, what is that about and uh, what is the mission for that company? Yeah, so when I, I had an opportunity in back in 2008, 2009, um, I was at the NFL. Um, I wasn't sure where I kind of wanted to go with my career at the NFL and had an opportunity to start my own company. And really it was consulting. I'd made a lot of relationships. We talked about networking and putting yourself out there. I made a lot of relationships amongst the, the college conferences and their officiating coordinators. And I thought um, this would be a chance for me to kind of break, branch off from the NFL and do my own thing, work for myself. The NFL is a big corporation. I love it. I still, you know, I love my time there, but I, I just wanted to do something for myself and um, started under the hood, which worked with college conferences on their, you know, their football officiating, their instant replay systems, um, the vendors, the technical side, the rules side, the, the personnel side. So it was kind of all encompassing um, with replay and officiating. And, uh, and I was able to keep my relationship with the NFL and continue to work with them on a consulting basis. And um, it really was a, it was a great opportunity for me. And it was a real kind of eye opener, you know, working for yourself. I was used to going into the office and being surrounded by people. And now you're, you know, you're working from home and you have to motivate yourself and, and you, you know, your commute is a lot shorter, but you don't have a lot of people like, you know, this last year with the pandemic, right? A lot of people are, are working from home and working virtually. That was a, sure it was a transition for people that had never done it. It was a transition for me, but I really enjoyed it. And it just helped, it helped me learn more about football on the college side. And that helped me, um, you know, with what I'm doing today. Got to ask you that. Of course, you, like you said, done fishing, you've done internships. Like, I know you talked about your company, like what inspired you to do that? To, I guess, understand what officiating is because there's always questions about what is a catch in the nfl or college yeah. football like what inspired you to really start that company to do what it's doing today yeah it was it was really my background i came like i said i came from a non-officiating background i had to learn everything like a normal person everybody that i was exposed to in the officiating department when i started all of the kind of the, the head of the department, they were all former on-field officials. So they had that experience. I didn't have that experience and I had to learn the rules like just, you know, your normal fan would. And so for me, it was that, that education piece, teaching people about officiating because there are a lot of misconceptions. There are There is a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that I don't think people understand. So for me, that's what kind of pushed me and motivated me to say, hey, I want to, you know, I want to educate. I want to take what I've learned and the way I learned it, because I feel like I could then articulate that to to other people that don't have that officiating background because I didn't. And uh, and that was kind of really the big the big driving force for me. Um, and, and it still is today with what I'm doing and, 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 you know, on the broadcast and trying to help people understand the rules because they can get complicated. Like you said, what is a catch and, and everything else that we've debated over the years. So it's really just trying to help the viewer um, understand the game at a, at, a, at a higher level on the officiating side. Moving kind of more to the XFL, I've, we're reading some stories about the XFL potentially emerging with the CFL and the XFL coming back. Yeah. I know yourself was the head of officiating with that for the XFL. What are your like thoughts on that? Is that like a reality that's going to happen or is it, what, what is the process on that currently? Yeah. So um, I'm hopeful that, that the XFL, I think the initial plan um, was spring 2022 to try to get going again, obviously with the pandemic and everything that's happened around the world, it's been a challenge for, for not just sports organizations, everyone so I think right now the XFL is looking at, at strategic partnerships, um, which is smart and trying to align themselves with whether it's the CFL or broadcast networks um, to, uh, to kind of push forward. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I don't know, you know, I don't have, uh, you know, anything concrete, but I do know that the, the, with the people behind it uh, and obviously now with, with Dwayne Johnson and, and Danny Garcia and, and their group, um, the people that were that were already involved with the XFL, you have a good core group of people that are passionate about football, and uh, and so I'm, I'm I'm very optimistic that we'll see the XFL 
um, in 2022 or or beyond in the near future. Definitely enjoy some of the stuff on the sidelines. I hear the cameras, the audio, and maybe hearing some words you probably wouldn't hear yeah. in the end on the sidelines. But question with that was y'all did a great job of it last year, kind of understanding what is a catch and different rules. How would you think, in your genuine opinion, to bring guys to the XFL? Is it guys that were in the spring league, or is that process the same as before? How does that potentially change due to the pandemic? Yeah, I, I think I don't know if the if getting you know the players um, if that's going to change drastically. There are, as we saw, you know, it was only a five week window, but we saw really good football in the XFL, and and so there are players that are not on NFL rosters that are you know, that have either been in the league, you know, had, you know, training camp, you know, had a, you know, maybe a short stint with a team practice squad that are really, really good football players. And, and that's really where the NFL, uh, the XFL um, focused on those kind of that, that if you have, you know, 63, 65 players total on an NFL roster, you know, who are those last cuts? Who are those, those, those guys that were there through training camp, but didn't quite make the, make the squad. And, and they're really good football players. So I don't think the pandemic changes that. Uh, you know, I think with some of the NFL rules, um, with the expanded roster size, that could have an impact. But I think that'll go back, um, you know, as we get further and further away, hopefully through the pandemic and then beyond it. So I, I think you're going to have a really good talent pool again for the XFL. And, uh, and we saw some great players um, last year and some players that are now on NFL rosters. You know, P.J. Walker was one. Um, you know, now he's with the Panthers and, uh, and I'm just excited because I know the football was really good and I know there's just, there's more and more talent out there and, and the XFL, uh, you know, did a really nice job maximizing that. Couldn't agree more. And of course, back when the XFL first started, I was only like two or three. So whoever is part of the XFL, y'all have done a great job. Can't wait to see, of course, more football, but back to like college football. Back when I was 2006, where I was well, catch was a catch then. The rules changed. Out of the time you spent in like college football over the years and rules officiating behind the scenes, what rule do you think has changed the entire landscape of college football? Well, I, I'd have to say targeting has probably been the most impactful um, rule in college football. I think, you know, the, the catch, no catch, the catch rules – it, it happens so often during a game, so it always comes up. But I think when you talk about health and safety and protecting the, the student athletes from unnecessary risk, I think the targeting rule is probably the most important rule um, in college football today and maybe maybe ever. It, um, you know, it's a punitive rule in terms of you disqualify players when they do commit a targeting penalty. But I think we've seen just over the last 10 years as the rule has been in place, um, a change in behavior. We see players, you know, they're, they're aware of, of where they have to hit, you know, that receiver coming across the middle or the quarterback, or when they make that block on that defender that really can't protect himself from that, from that angle, um, you know, lowering the target, using the shoulder to the body versus going to the head neck area. And we just don't see the players lowering their head anymore or as much and using the crown of the helmet because that puts them at risk. Um, of injury. So I'd say the targeting rule has been the, the most important and certainly the most impactful. And, uh, and, and, and I think we've made some good changes to make it more consistent on the officiating side. And, and I think we'll continue to look at it and make sure, uh, you know, the rules in a good place going forward. Definitely would like to see how the, because targeting definitely is the one that's like questionable. Like you talk about rules and referees and behind the scenes thing and y'all have improved and we've seen that in college football. Do you think some of the rules or have you heard necessarily of officiating, maybe picking on players or giving penalty to certain players or what you call hating players or their personalities? Or is that just a thing like some people just get mad at just because they got called out for their penalty? Yeah, I think that's more of a, a perception than the reality. Sometimes it, sometimes the two kind of blur together. It's, you know, officials, they don't, you know, they scout the team's like the, the, the teams do. And what they're looking for is kind of like tendencies and trends, but not specific players. They're not sitting there and looking at, you know, well, number 72, he, you know, he, he got called for holding last week. So we got to watch him. They're really looking for more of just, just what teams like to do in certain situations. Do they go from a tempo perspective? Do they go fast? Do they huddle? 
you know, in third and short or fourth and short situations, what do they like to do? Because that helps them anticipate. But if there are players who who are continued, you know, um, habitual offenders in certain areas, they're aware of it. But ultimately, once the game gets going, um, they're not thinking about, you know, specific players. It's just when it goes against your team, you're going to, you know, you're going to complain, right? That's just the way, that's just the way it is. And from the officiating side, you just want to be as consistent as possible. And officials are going to make mistakes. It's inevitable. But the goal is, right, if we're calling the game the same way, it's got to be the same way the whole game. It's got to be the same way for both teams because because once you set that standard, then the players will adjust, the coaches will adjust. If you change it, now it becomes harder for them to play the game, you know, within the rules. Definitely agree with that one. I think sometimes referees or rules have a negative persona and this referee, oh, this referee is charging, this referee hates like you basically pointed out it's not personal it's not you're doing your job you're being professional but speaking about a catch rule that's been very unpopular in the nfl years and years ago man i know you the officiating the des bryant catch i know some people say it i say it isn't because when the cowboys lose i'm like kind of like stephen a smith here this giving it doing what he does on tv and i find that to be hilarious but besides the point in your opinion regardless of what could have happened. Do you think that was a catch or was it more just people that are excited? The Cowboys uh, lost at the worst possible time. Yeah. So, and, and I was involved in that call and, you know, under the rule at the time, it wasn't a catch and, and it really wasn't that difficult um, at the time, right? At the time, you know, Des, if you were going to the ground, you had to maintain control of the ball when you hit the ground and, and, and he didn't. And, and it was an unbelievable play, and it was such an athletic play. And I think, I think all of those things combined, um, and the fact that it, look, it was it was a playoff game. It was the Cowboys and Packers, two of the you know historically traditional good teams and, and big fan bases. Uh, and and it just kind of you know all of those things combined made it a very controversial play. We knew it was going to be controversial as soon as it happened, uh, just because of all the things that were you know in play. Um, but it wasn't a catch at the time um, under the rule. But obviously, that's one that's been controversial. And Cowboy fans certainly, um, they they remind me of that any chance that they get, even however many years later it is, six years later. Believe me, I remember that. And Cowboys fans saying, oh, it was a catch. And I just tell them it's a catch just because I don't want to have to deal with the argument because the rules <laughs> and the rules. And just like what you're saying right there. But why do you think, Dean, the – the catch rule, I know we talk about targeting college football. That's their rule. We go to the NFL, and it's like, it's a catch rule. Why do you think that one has been so more controversial over the years? That was before the Des Bryant catch and after. Why do you think that yeah. has unfortunately happened? I, I think instant replay has been a big part of it. I, I think with the advent of replay and the technology, when you think about the rules, they're written for on-field officials to make decisions in real time. and for a long, long time, right, the official, you know, made the call and everybody moved on. And now with instant replay and the technology that we have, um, the call is made and now we get to see it from six different angles, slow motion. And anytime you start to slow things down, that can distort what actually happened. And I think that's a big part of it. I think instant replay has made that rule more controversial and we can see more on video than, than the officials can see on the field. And uh, and I think that's made it that's made it you know uh, a topic of debate over you know in recent times. But but again, I think the 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 rule itself, I think it's in a good place. I mean, there's some things that um, you know I would certainly tweak about it. But but again, it's I, as long as I've been a part of the NFL and I was started in 1994, uh, people have been talking about the catch rule, and it went. People I know that were part of the NFL long before that, there were there was controversy about, about the catch rule. So I don't know if that will ever go away. Fortunately, yes. Thankfully, I'm not Detroit. Thankfully, I'm not Dallas. So that hasn't gone against my will, though. But speaking really about the NFL, you know, people, you spent some time like rules. Do you think or who do you think could be the biggest steal of the NFL draft this year? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, the draft, there's so much intrigue right now. After, you know, you got to figure Trevor Lawrence is going number one. And then after that, it's kind of like, okay, what are the Jets going to do? 
Um, you know, the San Francisco then trades up. Uh, a guy, you know, I, I feel like somebody that could be um, a steal is, you, you know, I, I like, um, you know, I like Justin Fields. I think he's going to be a really good, I think he's going to be a really good player. I know that's not kind of a, you know, he's going to be picked probably in the top five picks. Um, I, I don't know. There's there's so much right now in terms of after that first pick, what what happens. But the draft is an in, inexact science every year. You know, you you think you've got a good pick, and for whatever reason, the player doesn't pan out. Um, so I'm not I'm not going to make any bold predictions. I just know that um, you know there's there's a lot of good players out there, and uh, you know we'll see we'll see how it plays out. And it's going to be interesting to see you know who the Jets take and then who the Niners take. You know, if they're gonna if they're really gonna trade up to number three from for a guy like Mac Jones or or maybe they, you know, maybe they go with uh Justin Fields or even Trey Lance. Who knows? Hey, one of my friends is the comments here again, folks. I apologize for some reason. StreamYard doesn't show comments from my personal page, but somebody asked you, man, what is the protocol when players start fighting? Like examples like Miles Garrett with Mason Rudolph. It was yeah. like, he said she said, but we really never got to find out what truly happened in that incident. Yeah. So from an officiating perspective, when that happens, you, you want the officials to within reason, try to break it up. You don't, we always tell told officials don't grab players from behind when there's a, when there's an altercation because a player, right. You're already fired up. Somebody grabs you from behind, you react, you don't know it's an official. And then that could be a really bad situation. So always try to make yourself a presence Make sure they understand you're an official. They see the stripes. Get get in kind of in between before it escalates. In a situation like that, with with you know Mason Rudolph and Miles Garrett and all that, it's just you know at some point you have to worry about your own personal safety and, and people swinging helmets and things. It, it can get a little crazy. Um, you know, officials hear a lot of things that happen on the football field. You know, we talked about the XFL with the mic, the open mics and. Um, it's not always pretty. It's not always, you know, safe for work language. But um, yeah, officials have been involved. If, if there is something, you know, an accusation about something that's said, you know, officials um, who are in the vicinity have been brought in at times to say, okay, what did you hear? That type of thing. Um, you know, those don't happen very often. But from an officiating perspective, you're trying to de-escalate the situation. Um, and certainly you have to be aware, you know, of, of who to penalize, make sure you get the right number, because in a situation like that, you're going to have players disqualified, ejected from the game. Um, but you hope that those don't happen very often. Definitely. That was one of those was like, what really happened? Like you said, he said, she said, and I don't believe maybe they found out what really happened though. But Dean, I got to ask you before we can head out pretty soon again. Thank you so much for your time. And it's definitely Say in touch, though, when people see like you and your friends like on college football game day, like all they, they see all making the predictions and talking about the teams, but what is something people don't realize or how much time you have to put in for each of those shows per week during the college football season? Yeah, the preparation, what I learned on when I went to the TV side is how much prep goes into even just a, a, a five minute segment. It's it's unbelievable. And, you know, at Fox Sports, we have we have people like, you know, Brady Quinn and Reggie Bush and Matt Leiner and this whole crew, uh, you know, Bob Stoops is joining us this year. They, you know, they're they're working throughout the week on on preparing what topics they're going to talk about um, the, the crews that go out. And if 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 it's going to be a crew that's working, you know, the, the Texas Oklahoma game. You know they're preparing all week, like the like the teams are. They're watching film. They have there's there's calls with the you know certain members, whether it's each head coach, whether it's the quarterback, certain players. Um, it's it's a long process. It's a lot of work um, that goes into you know that that hour long segment during the pregame or that that three and a half hour um, you know window during the game. It's it's there's so much prep that goes into it. Study film work. Um, and that's what we're doing on the officiating, officiating side as well. We're looking at film. We do a video of uh, controversial calls or educational calls for all of our all of our talent and our production people. So it's a it's a seven days a week, 
um, during football season. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. Without a doubt, y'all do a great job in doing what y'all do there. But, Dean, what we do is – I do like the final thoughts here. So, folks, thank you all for watching. But before we go, let's go to this afternoon's final thoughts. Again, Dean, it's always much appreciated. Like I was telling you all before the show and, of course, after the show. But do you have any, like, shout-outs for anything you're doing, either off Fox Sports or Fox Sports or content that you're doing currently? Yeah, you know, we're doing – you know, I've been involved in a – in a documentary called Her Turf, which is about three female officials, football officials, and their experiences. And uh, and so we're we're hopefully going to make that available online so people can check that out. Check my Twitter, um, at Dean Blandino. Uh, and we, we hope to kind of expand on that and really just focus on more officials and their and their lives off the field, right? Because these are these are people like you and me and they have families and they have other jobs and a lot of things that that we're all going through. And sometimes when they're out at when they're out there on the field, we forget that because maybe they, they make a, a you know they miss a call and we start yelling. So we really want to try to humanize those officials and show, you know, show their the other side of, of what you know what we all see on the field. And and so um, just, you know, check that out when it's available. Like I said, check out my Twitter and, uh, and yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much it. I appreciate the opportunity. For sure. Mine's definitely stay in touch. Like I tell folks y'all after Dean Bedino's that when that comes out, we'll put the link in below for your Twitter and all the social media accounts. I look forward to kind of y'all's analyzing of the long corners this year, be just because they're in a definitely difficult spot. But again, thank you so much Dean, for coming on. Stay in touch and uh, good luck this season. Yeah, same to you. Thanks. Here's my old coffee. The Broncos are going to lose today. Never, there's nothing special. Small. Boy, Nanas are biased on Katie. That is a stupid idea. You're com no. If I can take it, one my team, I'll give the Colts the benefit of the doubt. Madden 21 was so bad. I'm gonna throw last time I'm getting my body again. Has he played? Has he started in the drive? I have to tell you. Tag them on Instagram. Second, and all these tantrums. I could have. Foreman coming out of Texas. Truly appreciate y'all.